Today's presentation will be given by Ian Shin, an assistant professor of history and American culture at the University of Michigan and a new LRCCS faculty associate. His teaching and research focuses on the history of the US in the world and Asian American history between 1850 and 1950. And he is currently uh, completing a book manuscript entitled Imperfect Knowledge, Chinese Art and American Power in the Trans-Pacific Progressive Era. It examines the geopolitics of Chinese art collecting and, and scholarship in the United States at the turn of the 20th century. His publications have appeared in the Journal of American East Asian Relations and the Connecticut History Review. He received his PhD from Columbia University. Today he will be speaking on Prizes of the Great Upheaval, the International Politics and Business of Chinese Art during World War I. Please join me in welcoming him. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I hope uh, I'm coming through on the mic okay. Let me know if you can't hear me. Um, thanks very much for the introduction, Mary. Um, let me begin by expressing my appreciation to Per Castle, my colleague in the history department, for nominating me to be a faculty associate um, and to join, the, the, to join LRCCS. Um, if, if the talk doesn't go well today, you can blame Per. Uh, <laughs> And, and also to Mary for extending the invitation for this talk. Um, as a new faculty member in the history and American culture departments, uh, and you may sort of wonder what an American historian is doing here, um, I have to say I'm very excited to join LRCCS um, and to engage with the Chinese studies community here at the University of Michigan um, in the work that I do uh, on the history of the United States and the world uh, and on Asian American history. Um, I also want to thank, before I start, uh, Ina for all of her help in arranging um, and publicizing this talk. So my talk today um, draws from US and British archives to explore the international politics and business of Chinese art during World War I. In particular, my focus is on how World War I facilitated the emergence of the United States as a cultural world power in the early 20th century, seen through its ability during the war to build uh, internationally significant collections of Chinese art and to become uh, a, a, a recognized authority in their study. The research that I present today is drawn from the fourth chapter of my book manuscript, which Mary spoke about briefly. It examines how Chinese art collecting in the first decades of the 20th century helped Americans cultivate and realize what I call a trans-Pacific ideology of American exceptionalism. This ideology consisted mainly of two parts. The first was the idea that Asia and the Pacific, rather than Europe and the Atlantic, would be the fulcrum of world affairs in the future. The second part of that ideology was the idea that the United States was exceptionally suited to be the leader in this region, and by extension, in world affairs more generally. Now, cultural legacies remain largely unexplored in the historiography of World War I, especially in terms of its impact on the United States. But World War I coincided with efforts that had already been underway for nearly a decade <coughs> to institutionalize the collecting and study of Chinese art in the United States. Core to these efforts was the belief that possessing and interpreting works of art produced by a foreign culture was an important measure of a country's status in the world. American collectors, curators, and scholars could not have foreseen the impact that the war would have on their ambitions to achieve greater cultural status in the world, but they nevertheless benefited from the economic and social disruptions that occurred in Europe. Before I begin, though, I want to give sort of three important caveats to the talk I'll give today. The first is that uh, I won't talk very much about the Chinese Revolution, but I want to recognize that much of the art that comes onto the international art market in the 19-teens is because of the upheaval that's also caused by the revolution. Um, but my argument, I think, is that if, if revolution made these art objects available, it, it was war that directed where they would go and where they would end up. The second is that while much has been written about the popular consumption of Chinese art and culture in the United States, my focus today will be not on that popular level of consumption, but rather on the elite institutions and individuals that shaped ideas and practices on a national level. And then finally, uh, I want to acknowledge that the Chinese art to which I refer, and that was the object of Americans' desires in the early to 20th century, was generally uh, of the traditional variety produced before the Qing Dynasty. Uh, many scholars have shown, and I certainly recognize, that Chinese art as it was understood and presented in China was a living and evolving rather than a bygone or fixed system of ideas, institutions, and practices. So those are three caveats I want to put on the table. But let me start uh, on the talk itself. What does World War I have to do with Chinese art and American exceptionalism? In this talk, I'm going to argue that the war functioned as a sort of pivot 
for the development of this trans-Pacific ideology of American exceptionalism. Some of this happened, we might say, sort of unintentionally, just as a natural outcome of economic disruptions in Europe caused by the war. In other cases, Americans proactively seized these opportunities created by the war. So I'll begin by briefly describing the subordinate position of American collectors relative to their European counterparts during the early stages of US engagement with Chinese art in the late 19th century. Next, I'll focus mainly on the events between 1914 and 1918, and I'll break this chronology in 1917 with the entry of the United States in World War I. I'm gonna use the British Museum as a case study and compare it to the progress of private and public Chinese art collections in Washington, D.C., in New York, in Philadelphia, and in Cleveland. And to do that, I'm gonna document three major sets of changes that happens during World War I in the operation of museums, in the acquisition of art, and in the production of scholarship. And then I will finish by assessing the post-war situation to sort of place this pivot uh, in its historical context. So many um, scholars have noted America's fascination with China's material and visual culture since the colonial era. This fascination reached new heights in the late 19th century with international expositions in Europe and also in the United States exposing wealthy American elites to Chinese paintings and sculptures, not as curiosities, but for the first time as fine art. As Americans began to build their collections, they relied heavily on European institutions, journals, and experts for guidance. A good example is William T. Walters, the gentleman you see on the left. I, I've always thought that is one of the most unflattering portraits I've ever seen of anybody. <laughs> he was a businessman from Baltimore uh, and one of the earliest American collectors um, to embrace Chinese art, specifically porcelain, in the United States. Um, you can see uh, a photo of some of his pieces that are now in the Walters Art Museum, uh, which was founded based on his collection in Baltimore, Maryland. Chinese and Japanese art first piqued the interest of Walters and his son Henry during their visits to international expositions in London, in Paris, and in Vienna. By 1884, when Walters published the first catalog of his collection, he had come to own at least 1,800 pieces of Chinese porcelain. Uh, that was, uh, or 1,800 pieces of which about 80% were Chinese in origin. In the catalog uh, for this collection, which is entitled The Oriental Collection of W.T. Walters, he gave the greatest credit to his collection, not to those people that he called, quote, the intelligent gentleman of China and Japan, but instead to A.W. Franks, who was the curator of the Department of British and Medieval Antiquities at the British Museum. Surveying the existing literature on Chinese porcelain, Walter's col uh, catalog cited exclusively French authors, reproducing entire translated passages from their published works to make up several chapters in his catalog. Walters recognized that significant gaps remained in the study of Asian art, and he looked towards Europe to address these shortcomings. He wrote, notwithstanding the numerous works that have been published, it is probable that we have as yet but an imperfect knowledge of the age. This is where I get the title for my book. History and meaning of much that appears in the collections of Oriental porcelain. And until some European residing in China, well versed in the subject and well acquainted with the Chinese language has obtained access to the stores of native collectors, we shall be, to a certain extent, working in the dark. A more extensive catalog of Walter's collection appeared 15 years later in 1899 under the name of Stephen Bushell, who was an English physician to whom Walters had been introduced by A.W. Franks. It's important to note that these European experts to whom Americans referred received little to no formal training in Chinese art. Indeed, as the forerunner of Chinese art history today, much of this scholarly endeavor really dovetailed with Sinology and to a lesser extent, Oriental studies. For example, Stanislas Julien, the French scholar whose work Walters cited in his catalog, was a professor of Chinese at the Collège de France, who translated and studied mainly philosophical and religious texts. Other writers possessed no scholarly credentials at all. Stephen Bouchel, who wrote the second catalog, uh, was able to write about Chinese art on the basis of his access to Chinese collectors because he was a doctor who visited them in their houses. Before the time of PhDs in Chinese art, the lack of former credentials governing the international Chinese art world is what makes this period an especially dynamic period of study. By 1914, then, you had a multifaceted enterprise for Chinese art in Europe. There were multiple journals dedicated to publishing research about Chinese art and numerous museums with sizable collections of Chinese art. At least two of these museums were dedicated entirely to Asian art, including the Museum for East Asian Art in Cologne, which opened in October 1913, just eight months 
before the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo plunged Europe into war. Talk about terrible timing. By contrast, Americans in the early 1900s complained that the United States was far behind Europe in art, that museum, in museum directors in the United States were, quote, not yet the proper people, and, quote, thousands of people in America are hungering for just the sort of uplift to be expected from the art of the Far East. But of course, as I would like to explore today, all of this would change with World War I. So World War I upended the existing order of the international Chinese art world when it came to the operation of museums, as I said, the acquisition of art, and the production of art scholarship. I want to start by looking at the British Museum in World War I. Events at the British Museum suggest that Chinese art scholars, curators, and experts in Europe, at least in Great Britain, quickly began to feel the effects of the war after the outbreak of hostilities in July of 1914. In her history of museums in the UK during World War I, Gaynor Cavanaugh observes that the British Museum took measures between August and October to safeguard its collections from air raids, including but not limited to moving objects from the upper galleries to the basement, installing safes for rare books and manuscripts, reducing lights in and around the museum, and improving the water supply in case of fire. So these photos you see are uh, of the British Museum during the war. They are, I couldn't find anything of the uh, Chinese galleries, but uh, you see some examples uh, of the steps that were taken to prevent potential damage to the museum's collections, in this particular case, uh, in the Egyptian halls um, and, the Assyrian, uh, and the Assyrian gallery. In March of 1916, the decision was made to close all national museums and galleries in London, not to preserve their collections, as it were, but actually to achieve a cost savings of 26,000 pounds a year. Later in the war, when the museum received warnings of more and heavier bombings, officials arranged for some of the collection to be stored off-site uh, in a new underground tunnel and for some other collections farther away in Wales. These closures and moves disrupted Europe's international primacy in the pre-war Chinese art world. Now, by contrast, the first years of the war were a time of growth for museums across the United States to showcase Chinese art. And to illustrate this point, I'm going to look at three institutions the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Cleveland Museum of Art in Cleveland, and the Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. In July of 1915, the director of the Met, Edward Robinson, announced the trustees' decisions to establish a department of Far Eastern art, the first time that the Met would have an Asian art department. He acknowledged that the idea for the department had been uh, coming for several decades, and indeed, the roots of the department reached back to the late 19th century when collectors like Samuel P. Avery and James Garland loaned their Chinese porcelains for display to the Met. New Yorkers were very proud of these collections. They saw them as symbols of their civic sophistication. So when the possibility arose, for example, uh, of the Garland collection being sold off in 1902 when Garland died, um, uh, the, the Evening Sun newspaper uh, said that, quote, New York will lose entirely a collection of porcelains which has not an equal in any of the great museums of Europe. Again, note sort of that comparison that they're making to Europe. Another, import, in, another important uh, component of the Chinese collection at the Met was the Heber R. Bishop Jade Collection, which is the photograph you see on the right. Uh, quite an amazing room, um, uh, which I think lasted until the 1930s or 1940s. The Heber R. Collection of Jades, given in 1902, numbered some 1,000 pieces. And then finally, the Met made its first purchase of Chinese paintings in 1913 with the help of a missionary turned government advisor in China named John C. Ferguson. By the time of its founding in 1915, the Department of Far Eastern Art could claim uh, an increasingly diverse and culturally sophisticated set of Chinese art objects, even if the museum was not yet quite up to the task of interpreting them. So if the creation of the Department of Far Eastern Art at the Met was mostly coincidental with the Great War, the hiring of its first curator owed almost entirely to the war. In the same article in which Edward Robinson, the museum's director, shared news about the creation of the Asian Art Department, he announced that the museum had hired uh, S.C. Bosch Reitz, a Dutch curator, to be its, uh, uh, its leader. Assessments of Bosch Reitz's qualifications to lead this new department of East Asian art at the Met really varied, but to those who were concerned with cultural life in New York, he represented a link to the rich culture and knowledge of Chinese art that abounded in Europe. So the Evening World newspaper, for example, celebrated Bosch Reitz's appointment and said, he is well known among collectors of Chinese and Japanese art in Europe, and especially among those interested in the ceramics of these countries. He's paid particular attention 
to the European collections of both Chinese and Japanese art as they exist in London, Paris, and Berlin. He was just prior to the breaking out of the present war, considered for an official place with the Grand Didier collection at the Louvre, which is a very large and important European gathering. The Met Museum considers itself fortunate in being able to secure his services. So in this way, Bosch writes represented the older period of US dependence on Europe for Chinese art expertise. But as the evening world alluded to, and as the Met also confirmed, the only reason that this expertise was available to New York was precisely because of the disruptions caused by the war. Robinson explained that though Bashreitz had never before held a museum position, he was to be appointed to, at the Louvre, quote, when the outbreak of the war caused its postponement by the ministry in France, with the result that he came to America this spring to study the collections in the United States, and advantage was taken of this opportunity to secure his services for the museum. With museums like the Louvre interrupted by the war, US institutions like the Met could pounce on European talent that became available. Interestingly, as Bush Wrights took his position at the Met, the man that he replaced, Wil Wilhelm Valentiner, left the museum and returned to Europe. I want to talk about Valentiner's case for a second because it's an interesting uh, illustration of how art museums in the United States became entangled in the politics of war. Valentiner was a specialist in Flemish and Dutch painting by training, but as curator of decorative arts, he became uh, put in charge uh, of Chinese art collections before the creation of the Department of Far Eastern Art in 1915. Again, this is a, a case in which somebody who has absolutely no formal training in Chinese art uh, becomes, uh, on a sort of battlefield promotion basis, uh, a curator of Chinese art. So he was on the committee to review the Met's first purchase of Chinese landscape painting in 1913 as a Flemish and Dutch painting specialist. Valentino was traveling in France in August of 1914 when war broke out. He volunteered for military service for his native Germany and was subsequently assigned to the 1st Field Artillery Regiment in Munich. Despite his service for the Central Powers, Valentiner remained close with his uh, American colleagues throughout the war. But not everyone shared uh, uh, a sense of concern for Valentiner, and this is what's interesting. In 1916, the Met received an angry letter questioning Valentiner's ties to the infamous sinking of the ocean liner, the Lusitania. And this is the letter, what it says. Quote, what is the relationship between Captain Max Valentiner, the supposed assassin of the victims of the Lusitania, and the officer of the Metropolitan Museum of New York, who left America over two years ago and is actually fighting, as I understand, in the German army? It is evident that from the German point of view, Herr Valentiner is doing his duty. But from the American point of view, I will not discuss the question of whether or not the trustees of the museum are right or wrong in thus reserving this position for a German. In either case, his long absence has clearly shown that his absence is not indispensable to the well-being of that institution. But it is certain that America would see him return with more pleasure if he is proven not to be related to the person above mentioned. So essentially questioning the ties between the captain of the Lusitania, uh, of the, of the U-boat that sank the Lusitania uh, and, uh, and uh, Willem Valentiner, the curator, just because they have, of course, the same last name. Museum leaders evidently felt compelled to respond, though it is unclear whether they did so out of affection for Valentiner or to safeguard the museum's reputation. In either case, they condemned the media's connection of the Met with the sinking of the Lusitania as erroneous, and they noted that positions on the museum staff were reserved for those who served not only in the German army, but also in the British and French armies. This controversy over Wilhelm Valentiner shows how wartime politics challenged the international art networks that were built before 1914. In Valentiner's case, at least, and he was, uh, in some, case, uh, some cases, an exception, um, these networks bent, uh, but they did not break entirely. The expansion of museum collections of Chinese art in the United States during World War I proceeded not only on the coasts, but also in the Midwest. The Cleveland Museum of Art is a fine example, according to the historian Krista Adams. From its founding in 1913, the leaders of the Cleveland Museum of Art envisioned the arts of Asia as part of the institution's mission to uplift the city. The fact that Chinese art was particularly cheap and available in the 19-teens made it even easier for Clevelanders to proclaim their city's rising prestige by acquiring and displaying the cultural patrimony of China from the most ancient and powerful periods of its history. Important donations and gifts in the spring and summer of 1915 anchored the Cleveland Museum's oriental collection, quote unquote, oriental collection. Uh, one of these was uh, a Buddhist stone carving donated by um, a Cleveland businessman named Ralph King in 1915. And then uh, another businessman, Worcester Warner, donated $150,000 to continue to help build the collection. 
Another Warner, Langdon Warner, whom some of you may know uh, from his reputation as a monument man in World War II, Langdon Warner consulted for the Cleveland Museum of Art in this initial phase uh, of Asian art collecting and wrote a memo to the director of the Cleveland Museum of Art, Frederick Whiting, and he said, because of World War I, European acquisition trips to China, quote, had practically stopped, and that an American agent with cash would, quote, find many things to buy. The example of the Cleveland Museum of Art shows a truly national movement afoot in the building of new Chinese art collections that, for these Americans, coincided profitably with the disruptions of World War I. Now, even before the Met and the Cleveland Museum of Art, even, even beyond these two museums, perhaps the most significant development of Chinese art collecting in the United States was the construction of what would eventually become the Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. On the left, you see an aerial view of the Freer Gallery as it was under construction in February of 1918 and the Freer Gallery of Art today. Um, they just finished a total renovation and reopened, I think, in the spring or summer of last year. It's a beautiful space. In 1906, Charles Freer, who is from Detroit, deeded his collection of American paintings and Asian art to the nation. And Charles A. Platt was commissioned as the architect to design the museum building that you see on the right in 1913. With the U.S. officially neutral until April of 1917, construction of Freer's museum in Washington proceeded even as the British Museum and other museums in, the, in Europe began to wind down their operations. After the site for the museum was selected in 1915, Platt's architectural plans were approved in May of 1916, and construction began in September. It proceeded in fits and starts for two years before Platt finally suspended work in September of 1918, but by then the war was already two months from ending, and so construction resumed the next summer. The building was essentially completed by autumn of 1919, and the Freer Gallery of Art officially opened to the public in 1923. So as I've shown, museum collections of Chinese art in the United States underwent significant growth during the first years of World War I. I don't mean to suggest that none of this would have happened if not for the war. As I noted about the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the establishment of a department for Asian art was in some cases decades in the making. But the density of this development during the early war years I think is remarkable. And elements of this development, such as the hiring of S.C. Bosch Wrights as the curator at the Met, were direct repercussions of that war. Now let me talk about art acquisitions and scholarship. Not surprisingly, as museums across Europe were shuttered during the war, art acquisitions and scholarship also slowed significantly. In December of 1914, four months after, British, after the British declared war on Germany, uh, Robert Lockhart Hobson, the man you see on the right, who was the keeper of the Department of Ceramics and Ethnography at the British Museum, wrote to Charles Freer that, quote, the traffic in works of art has practically ceased in Europe, and I suppose it is almost at a standstill with you. According to Hobson, the reason was that, quote, the collector has to make way for the destroyer over here, and all the surplus, surplus cash is invested in explosives. The next year, Lawrence Binion, who was Hobson's colleague at the British Museum and the keeper of the sub-department of Oriental Prints and Drawings at the British Museum, told Charles Freer, that he had been able to acquire exactly one figure painting from the Song Dynasty. Binion was pretty upset about that, and he wrote, I don't know when we shall be able to get any more, having had all of our funds taken away. By contrast, U.S. museums and collectors went on basically a buying spree. For example, Charles Freer purchased over 1,500 Chinese paintings, sculptures, and jades between 1915 and 1919 with 1916 right in the middle of World War I being the highest point of this successful run. The same was true in New York, as the Metropolitan Museum of Art enlarged the collection of its Department of Far Eastern Art, though not as prodigiously as Charles Freer did. Accession lists for the Met between July 1914 and November of 1918 show that the museum purchased or received almost 1,200 pieces of Chinese art during this period. Over half of these accessions came from the bequest of the department store founder, Benjamin Altman, uh, outside of this bequest and other gifts, the Met made 369 purchases of Chinese art during the total course of the war. Of these, the largest share, uh, about 200 pieces, were ceramics, followed by metalwork, sculpture, crystals and jades, and ivories. Notably, Freer's collecting concentrated in Chinese paintings, sculptures, and jades, while the Met was chiefly preoccupied with porcelain. 
As Freer wrote back to Lawrence Binion in February of 1916, quote, the outlook in America for a better understanding and appreciation of Oriental art is very gratifying. Hobson's speculation, perhaps his hope, that the traffic in Chinese art had also come to a standstill in the United States was, unfortunately for him, quite wrong. In Great Britain, the war stopped not only the trade in Chinese art, but also stalled the production of research and scholarship. Hobson explained that his book, Chinese Pottery and Porcelain, which was originally slated for publication in September of 1914, had been delayed into the new year because uh, of uh, wartime industries. Hobson's colleague at the British Museum, Lawrence Binion, likewise found his scholarly aspirations stymied during the war. He tried unsuccessfully to arrange uh, a, a lecture tour in the United States to earn money for a few months of traveling in Asia to study art. Uh, he wrote he needed to do that, quote, because our government will not allow any grants for such purposes or for purchases for years and years to come. An intriguing letter to Binion to Charles Freer one month before the armistice was declared, so in October of 1918, suggests that Binion actually did find at least one occasion to overlap his wartime volunteer service with his interest in Chinese art. He apparently traveled to France to lecture to British soldiers about Chinese and Japanese art in October of 1918. And the fact that military authorities thought that an Asian art lecture would boost troop morale is, is really striking. Unfortunately, we have no sense of what he said uh, to them uh, in the trenches. In any case, this was an exception rather than the rule, as the war sapped not only the finances, but also the time and the uh, intellectual energy that curators had for their work. Now again, I'll make a comparison with what happens in the United States. In the United States, Art historians were unhampered by such restrictions and thus were able to pursue their studies in China, in China during the early years of the Great War, while curators in Europe like Binion and Hobson found their mobility restricted. In 1915 and 1916, for example, the Museum of the University of Pennsylvania sent its assistant curator, Carl Whiting Bishop, to China, Japan, and Korea. I have a slightly later photograph of Carl Bishop in his Beijing office in 1926, which you see on the left. Bishop's expedition was the next step in a deliberate strategy to grow the museum's collection of Asian art. The issue, um, the December issue of the museum's journal explained his mission, quote, in order that the growth of these collections may be intelligently directed, the firsthand information from the sources of early Chinese civilization, sorry, I skipped a line in my, in my paper, in order that the growth of these collections may be intelligently directed with firsthand information from the sources of early Chinese civilization. It has been decided to send an expedition to China to study the native arts on their own soil. Now, while Bishop found only limited success in prospecting sites for antiquities, he had comparatively better luck buying up existing collections, which were again coming onto the market. In 1916, Bishop's purchases from China, most of them from Sichuan province, were put on display in Philadelphia, including the figure that you see on the right, uh, a figure of a tall guardian king that the Philadelphia Inquirer, quoting an Orientalist scholar at Oxford, called, quote, one of the most remarkable pieces of its kind extant. Curators in the United States also perceived a gap in international publications about Chinese art, and their aspirations to step into this space, though they were not always perfectly realized, demonstrates a growing confidence in the leading role that the United States should play in this realm of culture. In 1918, Hamilton Bell, acting director of the Pennsylvania Museum and School of Industrial Art, which later became the Philadelphia Museum of Art, proposed a quarterly journal of Asian art to be based in the United States. <coughs> Modeled after European publications in France and the Netherlands and Germany, Bell's journal would feature articles with original research, records of existing collections, updates on new finds, and reviews of exhibitions and books. Citing both European journals uh, that he knew about, Hamilton Bell wrote that their fortunes had fallen as a result of the war. So he wrote, both publications, quote, have either been killed by the war or are, at any rate, unprocurable in this country at present. It is impossible to say how long it will be after the war shall have ended before the Berlin periodical will resume publication. And Tongpao, which is the French and Dutch publication, was primarily devoted to literary and historic criticism and dealt only sporadically and occasionally with art. In Hamilton Bell's estimation, the decline of European scholarship, or at least the pause in European scholarship during the war, made the field ripe for Americans to harvest. He thus concluded that, quote, the proposed journal would have to itself a large and increasingly wide, wide field, not only in this country, but also in Europe and Japan, whereas here, the interest in the subject of the arts of the Far East 
is daily spreading. So again, in the realm of Chinese art scholarship, Europe's loss was America's gain. All of these pressures led curators in Europe, understandably, to feel like they were somehow missing out or losing ground, which is a feeling that they expressed consistently in their correspondence with American collectors. In a letter to Charles Free in March 1916, Lawrence Binion at the British Museum lamented the war's financial effects, not only immediately, but also he feared far into the future. Binion wrote, quote, heaven knows when we shall ever get any grant again for making purchases, not for many years, I dare say. So we must be resigned to America getting all the fine things and to our ho falling hopelessly behind. Many times Binion expressed a desire to visit the US to see all the beautiful things that he presumed his American colleagues were buying. But the war made such a trip nearly impossible. So instead, Binion could only follow from afar such tantalizing pieces of news as what Langdon, Fre Langdon Warner um, sent him in June of 1917. Warner wrote, quote, Freer has broken ground for at last, Freer has at last broken ground for his museum in Washington. But even better than that, he has added some extremely important paintings, some of which I have seen. Almost as if to tease the art deprived Binion, Warner asked him, quote, when are you coming over to see them and us? As if Binion had any control over the situation. Knowing Warner's personality, it is entirely reasonable that he was gloating just a little bit with this invitation. But this, what's, in, what's interesting is that this feeling of falling behind did not seem to have generated any kind of strong resentment or animosity between the two sides, likely because the transatlantic alliance moderated the competitive dynamic that began to develop between the United States and Great Britain before the war. Indeed, English curators like Binion and US collectors like Freer continued to collaborate in ways they had done before the war. One notable example of this collaboration was an essay that Binion wrote over the winter of 1915 to accompany the photographs that Freer had made of a landscape scroll painting entitled Grand View of Rivers and Mountains. That was the piece of, um, that was the painting that you saw in the title slide uh, of this presentation. Binion clearly delighted in the painting, even though as art historians today have noted, he misdated its age and also overestimated its formal qualities. Not surprisingly, Freer was very pleased with Binion's glowing assessment of the painting and distributed four dozen copies of it to leading museums and private collections in the United States. He wrote to Binion, quote, I feel confident that the information given will prove of real interest to many and neither you or I will regret the little ventures. Over the course of the war, the Englishman and the American enjoyed many such collaborations. The same spirit of collaboration and friendship could not be said for relations between German and American curators and scholars, however. In 1915, editors of German art publications approached Langdon Warner, who would later become famous as the curator of, the Asian, uh, of Asian art at the Fogg Museum at Harvard. He had just finished a one-year term as a lecturer at Harvard, but he was feeling sensitive about the fact that even though he had studied Asian art for nine years, he still hadn't published any research on the subject. Nevertheless, he rejected the Germans' request to write for them. As Warner told Binion, quote, the Germans have many times asked for articles, but of course I don't want to send them anything, even if it were possible. It seems that for some, the conflict between the Allied and Central Powers bled into their work in the world of Chinese art. Now let me talk a little bit about what happens in 1917 after <coughs> the United States enters the war. Um, uh, the United States declared war on Germany in, uh, on April 6, uh, 1917. Um, two months earlier, Germany had uh, decided to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, uh, and the United States severed diplomatic relations with Germany as a result. The entry of the United States in the war impacted the uptake of Chinese art to a certain extent. Chinese art historian Daisy Wang has documented the dip in Ch Charles Freer's purchases of Chinese art during the final two years of World War I, after the U.S. government enacted policies to raise taxes on incomes over $1 million dollars as well as on art imports, and also to reserve shipping for military use. So in 1918, Freer made only 73 purchases of Chinese art, uh, which is an 80% 80, 80 drop compared to the number of purchases that he made in 1917. This was the smallest number of acquisitions that Freer made between 1912 and 1919. After the war ended, Freer's collecting picked up again to 178 objects in 1919, the same year that he died. These statistics suggest that U.S. participation in World War I curtailed some Americans' ability to procure Chinese art. But not all buyers were so constrained. As the war entered its fourth year, Charles Free expressed his surprise in a letter to his friend and fellow collector Agnes Meyer that certain institutions, museums in the United States, seemed shielded from the effects of the war. 
and they continued to seek Chinese art objects in the market. In particular, Freer noted that the fine arts departments of the Carnegie Institution in Pittsburgh, now the Carnegie Museum of Art, and the Art Museum in St. Louis, quote, are really hungry and they must have sustenance. And so he agreed to advise both institutions in deciding what to acquire. Freer concluded optimistically uh, in a letter to Meyer, quote, notwithstanding the gloom of war, rays of hope do occasionally shine out. I think the, the sort of purchasing of art during uh, war by US museums can be attributed to the fact that the 1917, uh, the 1917 revenue measure that impacted Charles Freer's buying drew disproportionately from personal incomes and profits. It exempted educational and charitable institutions from a 10% tax on revenue from admissions. And as a result, these institutions may have been better positioned than individual collectors to, uh, to continue making acquisitions. It seems that the rays of hope that Charles Freer talked about also shined on the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which, unlike Freer, actually increased its purchases of Chinese art from 92 in 1917 to 145 in 1918. Two of these purchases, um, holy men traveling to the Buddhist heaven on the right, and Buddhist Lohans crossing the sea to the palace of the Dragon King on the left, they were made, in fact, with Charles Freer's help, who allowed the Met to buy them from the collection he was forming for the Smithsonian. Um, uh, these paintings were originally believed to have been Song Dynasty paintings. They have since been reclassified as Ming or Qing Dynasty works. Um, Bush writes, praised the paintings, uh, especially holy men traveling to the Buddhist heaven on the right, for their quote unquote robust beauty. He wrote, the delightfully drawn heads have been religiously spared. We can enjoy the spirited drawing of the heads of the anxious young priests who feel none too safe on the backs of their heavenly steeds, crowded together on their phoenixes and dragons. It's a little faint, but you can sort of make out the phoenixes here, the dragons here. Till they reach the end of the picture, till they reach at the end of the picture, the glory of heaven in a marvelous composition of clouds and saints. To Charles Freer, the paintings represented something entirely different. He told Agnes Meyer, quote, I am proud to be able to do my bit in the fight for civilization in America, even if I cannot shoulder a rifle against the sturdy Huns, in reference to the Germans. So in these two paintings, we see the multiple valences of Chinese art during World War I. To a museum curator like Bosch writes, they were masterpieces fit for a new collection. To Freer, who was then 64 years old and unwell, they were his contribution to the war. How did Chinese art dealers respond to wartime conditions? Collectors like Charles Freer made, made clear to their suppliers that the US entering the war would impact the American market for Chinese art. Like Europe, it was likely to dry up. This was Freer message, Freer's message in uh, September 1917 uh, to Yu Xiaoxi, uh, let me see, Yu Xiaoxi, uh, whose name you see uh, above his portrait on the left. Uh, Yu Xiaoxi was one of the several art dealers from China who regularly sold to Charles Freer. He wrote, quote, the war in our country has caused many people who would naturally buy such objects to stop and turn their money over to the government, either as war taxes or war contributions. Uh, in response, what's interesting is how Chinese uh, dealers uh, reacted to the slowdown in the market. Yo developed what was essentially a layaway system for his clients in the US. In March 1918, he told Freer that he had come, ac uh, come across a great number of really valuable uh, and wonderful art pieces. Um, and when Freer told him that he had no money uh, to, to buy these pieces, uh, Yo Xiaoxi wrote back to Charles Freer, these goods are especially superior and it will be difficult to meet with such again. And as I'm unwilling to offer them for sale in China, I have decided that to select the very best of these articles and pack them carefully and keep them securely in a safe place until the war is finished and peace restored. Then the market will become favorable again and I can send them to America. And I, sh I shall be greatly obliged if you will then do your utmost to assist me to sell them. So even in war, the business of Chinese art found a way forward. So let me conclude uh, with a few thoughts. Uh, first, I want to say, um, that's not the quote I want to show you just yet. Um, as it turns out, um, Binion's anguish about the British Museum and other institutions in Europe falling hopelessly behind was slightly premature. The galleries for Chinese art at the British Museum reopened in 1920, three years before the opening of the Freer Gallery of Art. During the 1920s, exhibitions featuring Chinese art were held in Amsterdam, in Cologne, in Berlin, and in Prague. 
In many ways, their culmination was the international exhibition of Chinese art held at the Burlington, uh, Burlington House in London from November of 1935 to March of 1936. This was a fairly famous exhibition organized by uh, British collectors like R.L. Hobson, whom we met earlier, uh, George Eumorphopoulos, and Percival David, uh, whose um, collections are still on display in London today. Many US institutions also participated in the Burlington House exhibition, including not only better known museums like the Met, but also the St. Louis City Art Museum, the Toledo Museum of Art, and the William Rockhill Nelson Gallery in Kansas City, now today the Nel Nelson Atkins Museum. Jason Storber argues that their participation in the Burlington House exhibition granted, quote, instant credibility among larger and older museums uh, and Western museum institutions by positioning them to fill a gap in the West for access to world-class examples of Chinese art. So in other words, Gre uh, Great Britain still had the clout to organize a blockbuster show of Chinese art in the 1930s, but they now worked with Americans as indispensable partners. So to, to summarize my, my argument, the international politics and business of Chinese art during World War I helped put the United States on the map. New museums and new departments within existing museums popped up around the country. These institutions acquired Chinese art at exactly the same time that their European counterparts found their hands tied. And they continued to do so, albeit on a more limited basis, even after the United States entered World War I in 1917. Americans also invested in research by sponsoring expeditions and initiating scholarly publications that would overtake their older European cousins. To these collectors and curators in the United States, Chinese art represented more than something to be admired in a gallery. It was a symbol of their standing in the world. I want to end with this quote now by Liu Xiaoxi, the art dealer with the layaway plan, which really nicely encapsulates how Chinese art and international politics were intertwined during World War I. Writing to Charles Freer in the waning days of the war, Yo used Chinese history to make the case that the US government should not levy an import tax on ancient works of art. Those of you who are following the trade wars will notice that this was also the same discussion happening last fall, which uh, resolved in the favor of auction houses and art dealers uh, in the United States. Yo described how various imperial dynasties in China had risen and fallen based on their appreciation for art and culture. He concluded, in his letter, quote, the influence of such culture is most essential, and time cannot destroy it. It is incomparable. And where can we find the source of this influence? It is found in the investigation of ancient things. For ancient things were designed by the thought and skill of learned and cultured men. And each thing being made for a special purpose, and each painting having its own wonderful expression and beauty. They became models for later generations to copy. But such excellence could not be attained except by slow and careful work. Yu Xiaoxi recognized with a pretty heavy dose of self-interest that investments in Chinese art and antiquities during World War I had the potential to transform the United States into a cultural force to be reckoned with on the world stage, even as older imperial powers like Great Britain and Germany would implode. Thank you very much. As we are recording today, we appreciate it if you use the mic when you ask a question so your question will be heard on the recording. Does anyone have any questions? When you were talking about scholarship on Chinese art, it made me think of Ernst Fenelosa in yeah. Japan. And so if you could compare what you see here on the Chinese side with yeah. Japan. Uh, in the early teens and so forth, you get a, a rather miscellaneous group of expats teaching in Beijing. Yeah. But I don't know any of them that worked on Chinese art, for instance. Yeah, Ernest Fenelosa is an interesting case, and I debated whether or not to put him into the talk. Um, Ernest Fenelosa uh, went to Japan, uh, and while in Japan, uh, became an expert on Japanese art, uh, and then later learned about Chinese art. He went back to uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, where he cultivated uh, the, the Asian art department there. Um, the reason why uh, I, I decided to leave him out eventually is because he is in some ways sort of an anomaly. Um, he is uh, sort of certainly the most recognized expert um, on Asian art in the United States whom Charles Freer actually learns from, uh, but he dies um, and Charles Freer is left to sort of carry on his, his torch. Um, Fenelosa is uh, favorably compared to uh, European curators in, in the early 1900s. So he really does stand out as somebody who 
uh, is starting to, to learn what this field is about. Um, but uh, you know, one of the things that, that makes him striking is that he does sort of stand out as an anomaly in that regard. Um, and everybody else is still waiting to catch up uh, until the 19 teens. Thank you for the question. Ina, is that okay if I? Is that on? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this talk. I came in with two uh, evidently misconceptions, uh, one of which I think you've shattered really well, and the second of which I want to ask you about because I don't think you really addressed it. But the first one is that I came into the talk thinking that a lot of this activity, cultural research, this engagement with Chinese art, um, was started by the Europeans. Yeah. And I'm one of the many people who fetishize Oral Stein and Paul yeah. Pelio and that, that group of people. But you've demonstrated really well that World War I was a rupture for the Europeans in terms of their engagement with the fine arts ex-China. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense for me. The second misconception that I had was that um, uh, uh, the United States' specifically engagement with, the, with Chinese art came uh, at, at another rupture, which was 1949. Mm. And I had thought this may have to do with my personal family history, but I had thought that a lot of these pieces came to the United States from people, from the Shanghai Landers, from the yeah. residents of Tianjin, yeah. uh, who had already collected the materials yeah. in China. Yeah. And then, you know, when they fled either to Hong Kong or to New York, depending yeah. on where they were coming from, or, or the West Coast, San Francisco, brought a lot of this art with them. Yeah. So again, I'm sure that's a misconception because you've demonstrated quite well that there was this uh, activity in, uh, as a substitution for the European activity. Yeah. But what of the 1949 rupture and how that caused increased, I assume, engagement with the fine arts from China? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, the, what it makes me think of is, is um, some of you may know of Warren Cohen's work uh, on uh, Asian art collecting and American culture. Um, and he calls uh, sort of the period that I'm looking at, uh, which is roughly sort of the late 1890s to roughly 1920, which uh, sort of coincides with Charles Freer's um, um, art collecting career, as the golden age of uh, Asian art collecting in the United States. Um, and this is where you really begin to see sort of the, the first serious collections uh, and serious attempts to understand uh, not only Chinese but also Japanese art. Um, so I think there are probably two major um, moments Right, and, and uh, not surprisingly, they, they tag to major events in China, uh, both the, the sort of collapse of the Qing Dynasty and the revolution, which releases, again, a, a lot of art objects out into the market. But again, my, my argument is that uh, you know, the availability meant that then somebody had to decide where they were gonna go. Um, and World War I created sort of the, the situation by which Americans could redirect that flow in some ways away from Europe. The second moment, again, having to do with upheaval in China would be uh, the, the, the communist you know, revolution in 1949. So I, I think both of those are, are, are important points. Um, uh, Mary referred earlier to uh, my, my expertise being from 1850 to 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like to joke that <laughs> anything after World War II I'm a little fuzzy on. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, question because it challenges my periodization, right? Um, if, if, this is, uh, if this is at least one high point, uh, of, of Chinese art collecting in the United States. What does it mean that we have a second one in 1949? Right. So I, I appreciate that, that, that suggestion. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, I have a question about the politics that um, were going on in China. I know you, mm. you prefaced not talking about the revolution, but specifically yeah. like the new culture movement that's yeah. going on at the time. Yeah. And this you know, kind of rise in Chinese um, yep. nationalism as a yep. reaction to what's going on in World War I. Um, and, and earlier, obviously, other things going on. But um, specifically, when Yu Xiaoxi says that he doesn't want to sell these um, artifacts in China, yeah. but rather he basically is talking about sort of a global market. I mean, yeah. how does a global market interact yeah. with this kind of rising yeah. nationalism? So um, many of the Chinese art dealers, um, and I'm thinking specifically of, oh gosh, what's his name? <coughs> C.T. Liu, um, uh, a famous Chinese art dealer, art dealer are seen as traitors um, for the work that they do in passing Chinese art objects uh, to the international market. Um, and their reputations are still a little bit iffy. Um, but I think one of the things that draws me to this particular period and this history is that there are no you know, 
demons or saints in the story. Um, you would maybe expect uh, you know, Chinese art dealers in a period of nationalist sentiment to think about keeping these art objects uh, in the country, right? And, and certainly that's sort of what we see today is sort of the repatriation of uh, Chinese artifacts that uh, have been either looted or, or purchased on the market uh, back to Chinese museums. Um, but they were out to make a buck. And they did it really successfully, especially if you think about it in the context of the exclusion era. Mm -hmm. uh, these, were, these were merchants who found ways, you know, and I, I've, I've sort of been to the National Archives in San Bruno in the Bay Area to look at the ways that they uh, inter uh, interacted with immigration authorities. They brought in you know, tens of thousands of dollars of merchandise, crossed the entire continental United States, held multiple meetings with investors and buyers in Detroit and New York. These are major commercial enterprises carried on uh, in, the, uh, in the context of the exclusion era. And I think Chinese nationalists were not happy about it. Mm -hmm. so. Questions over here? Uh, actually, um, my question was gonna relate to that, but I can uh, specifically uh, hone in on acquisitions in terms of black market activity during yeah. the war. And how much of the art that uh, figures like Yao um, and other art dealers, uh, you know, uh, collected? How m how much of that was, you know, through, let's say, unethical? Yeah. Um, you 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 are touching on that, but if you right. have any more details of stolen art and and so uh, forth. It, it's it's um. I mean, law and ethics are two very different things. So it's hard to say uh, what what. Um, you know, in a period where there were very, there were few regulations on, you know, what you could do, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, art dealers like Yo and, and others would hire um, uh, sort of workers to, to go rip things off walls uh, in caves uh, and, and uh, you know, take those uh, back to, um, to the cities to be sold. Um, these weren't exactly underground or black market. I mean, Yo and other dealers like him had uh, well-established businesses in Shanghai, um, stores that people would visit and were very well known. Um, so they weren't exactly sort of trading behind anyone's back or under the table. Uh, but in terms of how they got these objects, um, there, there certainly are uh, ethical objections that people could have uh, in terms of how they were procured. One of the mics was passed over to me, so oh, I guess great. I'm next. Um, I'm curious, so um, Nico brought up the some, some people who we would think of as maybe archaeologists or paleographers. Mm. Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on whether there's sort of a, a separate or parallel history with ethnographic yeah. and anthropological collecting versus whether it's part of the same story. Like well before the war, you have Franz Boas sends Berthold yeah. Laufer to right. China to collect right. material for the American Museum of Natural History. And it was intended to be an ethnographic expedition, but a lot of what he brought back were art objects. And right. so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, on the differences or connections between those two yeah, traditions? Yeah, oh, excuse me, excuse you. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, that's one of the trickiest parts of, of this project has been design, defining exactly what counts as ethnography and what counts as fine arts. Um, the, the, it seems like it's sort of an eye of the beholder kind of situation uh, where people like Charles Freer um, are collecting you know, things like uh, you know, religious sculptures, uh, Buddhist sculptures, um, and their idea is uh, that this is art and not ethnography. Um, and I think that maps to, you know, sort of the, the theory um, that art historians have pointed to, which is that objects change in meaning, you know, over, over their, their sort of circuits from the places of origins to where they end up. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a line that does kind of waver uh, and bend. Um, and in some ways, you know, it, it's up to the, the American collectors who, depending on the authority that they have, can reclassify certain things as either art or ethnography. Thanks, Ian, for, uh, for your talk. Like Nico, I, I learned a lot from this. Um, and my question is, is somewhat similar to Liz's, which is, uh, but more within the category of fine art. Yeah. Um, yeah. So sort of the, the collections that you're describing mm -hmm. include some paintings, but yeah. a lot of it is jade, yeah. and porcelain. And so this yeah. raises the question how European and American uh, collectors at this time mm -hmm. perceive the relationship between what they deem to be Chinese art and um, and European art, yeah. um, right? So, so there seems to be some effort to create Chinese art in, in the image of Western art, like 
focusing on sculpture, which right. is right, not one of the major arts within the Chinese discourse. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder whether you, whether you could say something more about that, yeah. how, how that relationship was perceived. Yeah, so in terms of how um, different kinds of art objects became classified as either fine arts or, or not uh, in the United States versus in China, there are lots of debates over it, and this is one of the things I track in the larger project in terms of how uh, the, the, the distinctions are made uh, not not, um, what am I trying to say? The distinctions are made um, with various different kinds of, of contests happening. So for example, um, uh, people like Charles Freer would look at William Walters and say that he's not a serious collector because he's only collecting porcelains rather than paintings. Um, but then somebody like John Ferguson who buys paintings for the Met would look at Charles Freer and say, you're not a serious collector because you don't understand anything about chain paintings. Um, and literati paintings um, are valuable um, and significant, um, and uh, uh, Freer doesn't want to collect anything after the, uh, the Ming Dynasty. Um, and so uh, even within sort of this group of, of American collectors and experts, there are various debates, uh, and this is what to me is fascinating again about this period, is the rules have yet to be made up uh, in the United States. And so there are all kinds of intellectual uh, contests over authorities. It's not that in some ways, it's sort of a surplus of ideas, uh, and, and they need to sort of figure these out and sort these out among themselves. Uh, and so uh, I don't know if that sort of answers your question. The, the European component is, is interesting also. Um, the Brits uh, are more focused uh, on uh, uh, porcelains at first, uh, and one of the ways that Americans start to stand out is by more seriously collecting uh, both religious objects uh, and paintings. Um, uh, and, and so uh, you see a little bit of moving around of different object types in the British Museum. They get reclassified uh, from one department to another. For example, the, um, so Lawrence Binion, who has created the uh, keeper of the sub-department of Oriental Prints and Drawings, right? That's a shift that happens, and that's why it becomes a new sub-department, because there's some recognition that uh, these, these are a legitimate group of, uh, uh, of art objects that need to be um, dealt with on their own. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ian. This is really wonderful, and um, I learned a great deal about this. And I love, I love your images. I have a question about the individuals who are involved in this, right? Because you started off with saying that um, there's this rhetoric that a great country needs to have this, you know, great cultural presence. We need to collect Asian art. That's how we project our authority over this Asia Pacific area, right? So I'm wondering if you can talk about the individuals, the collectors, and how they um, either responded to larger trends or else created this kind of rhetoric as a justification for what they're doing? Because one of the things I'm kind of curious about is, um, you know, why these individuals decide that Asian art is their mm -hmm. bailiwick. Mm -hmm. And related to that, I'm, I I'm very interested in, um, in Yo, who I assume is writing to Freer in English, right? Yeah. So what kind yeah. of cultural milieu is he part of? Is yeah. he one of these trained abroad? Is he, you know, missionary educated? Is yeah. he Hong Kong educated? Like, wh where are these people kind of connecting with each other? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Yili. Um, so let me tackle that last part first, and then maybe I can back into the first part of your question um, uh, second. Um, the the Folks that we see who are art dealers, um, I've had a little bit of trouble tracking them down. They sort of pop up uh, at various parts, and I've been trying to, to get a better handle. I, I'm excited to do more research next year with the help of, a, of an Eisenberg Faculty Fellowship uh, with Chinese language sources. Um, and if any of you know Chinese grad students who might be interested, please let me know. Um, but because uh, my reading uh, in Chinese is, is uh, about a fourth grade level, since that's when I immigrated to the United States. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the backgrounds that I've been made able to find so far um, is that uh, most of these dealers seem to be trained on an apprenticeship model. So they'll usually travel with a couple of younger folks who come with them on these trips. Uh, I found evidence of them uh, then splitting. These partnerships split because one person starts to create a back channel to some collectors uh, and, and uh, sort of go off on their own. Um, they also have links to the comprador world, um, uh, specifically one uh, dealer um, or, or agent uh, for American collectors, uh, uh, you know, grew up uh, uh, in Hawaii uh, and then worked as a, a comprador uh, in Hong Kong. Um, so they have that exposure to uh, English language, uh, to, you know, Western merchants uh, and are able to, to navigate through that world. Um, 
so your first, the first part of your question, though, was about the sort of um, politics of these individuals. Um, and this is, this is, again, what I find most interesting is because art historians talk about Charles Freer, um, uh, uh, Lawrence Binion, you know, uh, R.L. Hobson, but they don't really pay attention to their politics and how they think about the significance of their, um, of their collecting uh, as a political activity. And that's really what I'm most interested in. So and I think one of the really uh, um, fal fabulous points of intera interaction in that regard is Charles Freer's relationship with Teddy Roosevelt, right? who is the president when Charles Freer decides to deed his collection of Asian art and American paintings to the United States and to the Smithsonian to create the Freer Gallery of Art. Teddy Roosevelt is over the moon about this, right? Loves this idea. And, and I think we can sort of trace that, that sort of political connection between Teddy Roosevelt's sort of idea of the United States and the world, especially his attention towards Japan and other areas in Asia, right? And his, uh, his feeling that uh, Asian art is something that the United States needs to have, in fact, needs to have on the mall in Washington in order to be seriously considered as a world power. So I'm still drawing out that, but I see some connections uh, you know, in terms of these uh, um, elite collectors, and that's why I focus on them, because they're able, they, they help me to trace out sort of these political connections in terms of the significance of Chinese art collecting. I think we've got a mic coming. Uh, in your studies, have you discovered any influence of Christian missionaries? Uh, several of them have had uh, strong influence on yeah. scholarship in other areas, primarily mm -hmm. translations of uh, mm -hmm. Chinese classics. And do they have anything to do with the, the art world? They, they absolutely do. Um, so John Ferguson, who again was the man who helped the Met buy its first batch of Chinese paintings, goes over as a missionary. Uh, and then, like many missionaries do, sort of winds their way through lots of other jobs that they get by circumstance, uh, becoming uh, a, a, a trusted government advisor at one point. Uh, but uh, they're able to sort of do that um, um, because of the need for, uh, or, or, or um, yeah, the need for sort of f uh, foreign uh, advisors, uh, which Jonathan Spence has, has written about. Um, so uh, John C. Ferguson is one. There are other missionaries who go over and buy art um, uh, in the uh, 1890s uh, that I've found. Um, they aren't, interestingly, the people who come to the fore as um, the most important collectors. I think probably part of that has to do with money. Um, they, they, they go over, they buy what they can, but they don't have the capital like the major industrialists to put, in, put those pieces of art into uh, big, big collections and, and museums. Uh, so they serve as a, a conduit uh, for some of these collectors, especially early on. Um, uh, later on, they sort of recede into the background as Chinese art dealers, like uh, Yu Xiaoxi, come to the fore uh, and in some ways sort of take over that, that, that role of being a conduit between the United States and China uh, for art purchases. A second part of the question yeah. is the interest in Chinese art as these museums were being established, did it influence uh, scholarship in other areas of Chinese culture or history? Mm. So one of the things that I, I hope to do is to put this project on art um, in conversation with, uh, especially, uh, I think a lot more work has been done on um, uh, literature. Um, and uh, if we're thinking about um, the most recent book, I forget the author's name, The Floating Chinaman, uh, whom some of you, uh, the, the book that some of you may be familiar with, um, there, there's also a lot of uh, contests over who gets to represent China or speak on behalf of Chinese culture in the realm of literature. Um, you, you have you know, Chinese uh, uh, writers who are uh, fighting with people like Pearl Buck, um, who have uh, more prominent positions in the literary world in the United States. And I see this project very much in line with that, which is who gets to speak for China and Chinese culture. Um, and, and you have, again, at a time where there aren't a lot of rules uh, on who, who is an authority and who gets to claim that authority. Um, uh, that in the art world you have similar kinds of contests uh, uh, that I, I think are, that run in parallel with other areas of Chinese culture. So, thank you. Thank you. There's a question in the back. Um, during the periods in question, did you notice any big price variations between the prices Europeans and Americans would pay? 
So price obviously serves as the balancing point between supply and demand, and I'm wondering if what, what we see in pricing? That's a great question. I don't have a good sense of that. I would need to go uh, more deeply into the accession records. Um, I don't, actually. Uh, I don't have a good, good answer for that uh, in terms of the, the numbers, but I, I will certainly look into that. Um, I hadn't really thought about price as a lever uh, uh, or an indicator uh, for supply and demand, uh, but that's, I've been mostly looking at sort of volume, right, which as you, as you suggest is, is not the most uh, 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 granular um, indicator for, for, for that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you for this great talk. I have a question about the art market yes. within China during that time. Yeah. So is that means the rise of art market in the United States or the, the art flow from China to US has much to do with the slumping domestic sale in China at mm. that time mm. uh, because of the, as Mary said, the, the modernization I uh, first in yeah. China or something. Thank you. We're, we're getting in really into the economics, um, <laughs> two questions in a row. Um, so one of the things that I think we know about the Chinese art market, um, at least in, uh, uh, in this period, is that there's sort of two. There's one where that Westerners can access, and then there's sort of an, uh, an internal one, quote unquote. And this is, this is something that Jim Cahill writes about. Um, um, he's a, a noted art Chinese art historian uh, who's, who passed recently. Um, but he talks about sort of these uh, separate art markets, and, and the one thing that we see is uh, Americans continually trying to get their way into that internal art market uh, because the, the, the sort of good stuff, right, the, the sort of real Chinese art is kept for, some would say, uh, the, the purchase and, and purview of, of Chinese collectors, uh, and, and sort of the second um, grade, second tier stuff is what is made available to, to Western collectors. To some extent, you see uh, American collectors uh, successfully starting to get into that in the 19-teens. Uh, Freer makes five trips uh, to, to China uh, over the course of about a decade. Um, and with each successive trip, he gets closer and closer uh, by meeting more uh, native collectors who share the collections with him. Um, but the, the, the art market you know, is, is, um, it is a, a complicated thing because again, there are these sort of uh, two levels um, uh, and, and so, uh, to some, to some extent, Americans are trying to, to, you know, go as deep as they can, um, but, but it's, uh, it's an uphill battle for them. Any other questions? I want to th thank Ian for the fabulous thank talk and thank you for coming today.